The cranial circulation is not complex. I know it seems complex, but it's not. If you figure out the ideas that rule its organization, it becomes pretty manageable to understand what is what and why they're there. I'm gonna give you a broad overview, teach you the main principles, and then show you how it all comes together. I'm gonna cover the venous circulation as well. A lot of other sources skip this part, and I think that's one of the reasons why many people feel like their understanding of cranial circulation is incomplete. Okay, let's begin. The brain is a big, bulky organ, so it needs a lot of blood. Not only that, it so happens that the cortex of the brain is highly metabolically active, perhaps even more so than the inner core. So while other solid organs, such as the spleen and kidneys, receive one big artery in the center that spreads from within, the way the brain works requires that so much of the blood supply needs to reach the surface that the arteries actually wrap around the brain in order to branch out and capillarize where they're needed. Another important issue is that the neck is mobile. The fact that the neck has degrees of freedom to move and bend means that, depending on the position, substantial pressure is put on certain areas. If we had only one artery supplying the brain, we could eventually kink that artery and stop the blood supply during movements, which, as you can imagine, wouldn't be that safe in our natural habitat. Something similar happens in the hand, for example, where the mobility of the wrist is compensated by double supply from the radial and ulnar arteries and with rich collateral circulation between the two in the arterial arches. Okay, so what did nature come up with for our beloved brain? We get blood from bilateral carotid arteries and vertebral arteries, which in the end come together to form a circle of collateral connections, the famous circle of Willis. I'm going to take you step by step with each of these arteries to show you their branches and their turns, but let me give you the foundational blocks first. We are taught that there is an anterior and a posterior circulation, made up of the carotid arteries in the front and the vertebral arteries and their branches behind. This division certainly makes sense in the neck, but I don't think it's quite as informative in the head. The carotid arteries supply this part of the brain, while the vertebral arteries supply this part. So I think it's actually more appropriate to think of this division as between superior and inferior circulation. The superior part supplied by the carotids, covering most of the surface of the brain and the eyes, while the inferior part supplied by the vertebral arteries covers the brain stem and the cerebellum and the inferior surface of the brain. Okay, so let's look now at the step-by-step -step of each of the main arteries and their territories starting with the anterior or superior circulation. The internal carotids are a continuation of the common carotids. After they enter the brain, they make a series of bends and turns that make it look like a siphon. In the end, they branch out into anterior cerebral and middle cerebral arteries. But before bifurcating, they give out a few smaller but important branches. First, the hypophyseal arteries, which supply of course the pituitary and the hypothalamus just above. They make up the portal hypophyseal system, of which you'll hear about in physiology classes. Then there's the ophthalmic artery, the destination of which shall remain nameless. And in the posterior side, they give off the anterior choroidal artery, which supplies, of course, the choroid plexus of the lateral ventricle and the surrounding structures, such as the caudate nucleus. The last non-terminal branch of the ICA is the posterior communicating artery, which is a part of the circle of Willis. We'll talk about the circle later. The ICA ends by splitting into anterior and middle cerebral arteries. The anterior arteries run enteromedially, they give off a communicating artery right in the beginning, which is of course named anterior communicating artery and is made up of a stump from each side. And the anterior cerebral arteries continue to run on top of the corpus callosum, supplying what's around it. And this of course includes the cortex of the lower limbs, as you have heard to emesis in school. <laughs> the middle cerebral arteries go laterally. They make a posterior turn and run on top of the insula, supplying it and the basal ganglia that sit deep to it. Running along the lateral fissure, they supply the majority of the cerebral cortex, covering most of the frontal, parietal, and temporal lobes. And that's it for the carotid system. You can see that not much cortex is left for the vertebral system. It's only the inferior surface and a small part of the medial surface that are supplied by it. But let's go back and start from the beginning. The vertebral arteries are the first branches that leave the subclavian arteries. They run upwards, going through the transverse foramina of each of the cervical vertebrae, and as they reach the skull, they have to make a sharp turn backwards to enter through the foramen magnum. They join each other in the beginning of the pons, forming the basilar artery, and as it reaches the midbrain, it splits again into the two posterior cerebral arteries. In the course of this system, there are several branches that are important to remember, but actually difficult to memorize if you don't realize they have a pattern. So let's take a look from two different views again to get a better sense of what's going on. The verts usually don't give off any branches before they reach the skull. And remember, they make this weird turn to gain entry. Then they give off two sets of arteries before merging into the basilar artery, the spinal arteries and the first set of cerebellar arteries. There is usually a single anterior spinal artery running downwards and getting input from both sides, and bilateral posterior spinal arteries, 
The first supply to the cerebellum is the posterior inferior cerebellar artery, or pica, for close acquaintances. An important detail in this specific patient is that he had an anatomical variation. He happened to have two picas coming off of the right side, so we would have to hide away this branch here for you to see the standard anatomy. After the basal artery is formed, the icus sprout out. That's the anterior counterpart to the picus, with of course a territory supply that's self-explanatory. The basilar artery emits many little pontine branches in its length, and right before it ends, it emits the superior cerebellar arteries, and then split into the posterior cerebellar arteries. There are two important commentaries to be made here. First is that you saw that the cerebellum gets supplied by three sets of arteries, picus, icus, and the superiors. To remember this configuration, keep in mind that the arterial system is actually sitting at an angle at the base of the skull. So it makes sense that the first part to be reached is the posterior inferior part, then the anterior inferior, and lastly, an artery for the top. The second thing is that the superior cerebellar and the posterior cerebral arteries actually follow a very similar path, the only thing separating them being the tentorium. We can check out this other angiogram to see how closely they're related. Okay, so the posterior cerebral artery first supplies the medial surface of the temporal lobes, and then goes towards the calcarine sulcus, running on top of it and supplying the occipital lobe. And the PCAs also send off posterior choroidal arteries, which supply the choroidal plexi for the inferior lateral ventricle, and the third ventricle and their adjacent structures, which notably includes the thalamus. Also, most importantly, they each have a posterior communicating artery that connects them with the ends of the carotids, and this closes the circle of Willis, at which we'll take a closer look now. It is formed by the posterior cerebral and posterior communicating arteries behind, joined to the anterior cerebral and communicating arteries in the front so it gets blood from both systems and both sides. This means that a reduction in blood supply from any single incoming artery can be compensated by flow from the others, and it also means that, in chronic conditions, even dramatic reductions in flow from an artery can be silent, such as when atherosclerosis builds up in a carotid artery and can even block 100% of the flow in an artery and the person will still feel normal. You can simplify the circle of Willis by drawing this shape right here, a heptagon, with a side for each artery. To get a better reference, you can draw the continuation of the MCAs, PCAs, basilar artery, and ACAs. And that's pretty much it for arterial supply. See, it's actually not that terrible. Once you know it through and through, each detail becomes easier to recall. The venous system is even simpler. All we gotta know is that there are also two systems, the dural sinuses and the veins themselves. The dural sinuses are the bigger system, and they're the ones that in the end drain the blood away from the skull into the internal jugular veins. The sinuses are located primarily in locations within the dura mater where there are septations, such as the falx cerebri and the tentorium cerebelli. They are formed in gaps between the periosteal and meningeal leaflets of the dura mater, lined by endothelium inside. We have the superior and inferior sagittal sinuses in the ends of the falx cerebri, the straight sinus which connects these two, and the transverse sinuses in the origins of the tentorium. Blood runs in this direction, and the transverse sinuses turn into the sigmoid sinuses which as they leave the intracranial compartment, turn into the internal jugular veins. In addition to these outer sinuses, which sit in the convexity of the skull, there are the inner sinuses, that sit in the base of the skull. The cavernous sinuses in the front, which are connected to each other by the intercavernous sinus and drain into the outer system by means of the petrous sinuses. The superior petrous sinus goes to the transverse sinus, and the inferior petrous sinus goes to the sigmoid sinus. Aside from all that, there are the veins. They are less important, drain less blood, and in the end converge into the sinuses, which is why they are less commonly mentioned. Nevertheless, they are there. They are very variable, and usually only three are named. There are two commonly mentioned superficial veins. They are the anastomotic veins that come from this region and empty into the sinuses. There is a superior one and an inferior one. Internally, the relevant one is the great cerebral vein, which drains directly into the straight sinus, forming an almost continuous course. Each of them has their eponym. And I'm going to leave them here, in case you want to win extra points with your attending, and extra hate from your co's. And that's it. I know it was a lot all at once, but you're going to see that, now that you know more context in the story, the isolated facts become a consistent picture, and you're going to be able to recall or even deduce the missing details when you need them. Okay, so quick review. The brain gets blood from two systems, the carotid and the vertebral. The carotid is concerned with pretty much everything above the tentorium, and the vertebral with everything below it, and much of the inferior surface of the cerebrum. The blood is drained by the dural sinuses, which follow the dural reflections and empty into the internal jugular veins, receiving a little bit of blood from the cerebral veins, which are quite variable but have some fancy names. The major structure of the cerebral circulation is the circle of Willis, which is formed by this heptagon, which contains the major arteries of the brain.
Take a moment to review this sketch and try to name all the structures shown here. I'm going to give you three seconds to pause the video before I allow the labels to appear. Okay, how many did you get right? Now, why don't you go ahead and write down in the comment section if you have some other trick to memorize these arteries. And that's it! This concludes the last episode on the series on neuroanatomy. I truly believe if you watch the whole series a couple of times, you'll be well equipped to understand everything you need to know about neuroanatomy. And if you need more advanced knowledge, I recommend you study from the sections for general neuroanatomy, and if you need more neurovascular, I suggest in geographies. I appreciate you taking the time to watch this video, go ahead and share the series if you think your colleagues might benefit from it, and stay tuned to learn more about mysterious and intriguing subjects that you wish were made more clear.